Welcome to Radio Free New York. Hey, welcome to Radio Free New York. My name is Lou Perez. For those of you who are probably hearing about me for the first time, I am a comedian and a podcaster, host of the Lou Perez Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at the Lou Perez. And I'm so happy to be here on Radio Free New York. If you would like to call in, hit us up at 866-552-1009. And if you're in the Rochester area, 585-346-3000. Wherever you are right now, thank you for being here. I uh, couldn't do this alone. Um, I had to reach out to two really great friends of mine to be on today. One of them is in the very room that I'm sitting in right now. His name is Boris Hyken. He's a comedian. <laughs> and stop the, uh, right there. Uh, stop right there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and the other one is a longtime friend, also a comedian, Mr. Harry Turgenian. Hey, and guys. the reason why I brought these guys Thank together right now is because with everything going on, there's so much to worry about in the world. COVID cases are going up. But my mind is just on the future of comedy. What is going to happen to comedy when Donald Trump is no longer president? And I'm going to open that up to the room right now. What do you guys think is going to happen to comedy when Donald Trump goes away, leaves the White House? I mean, I think we got four to eight years not to think about this, so I'm not <laughs> too worried about it. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, thanks for having us, first of all, Lou. I thought when you were like, I couldn't do this alone, I thought you were going to like thank your wife and <laughs> your family. <laughs> but no, you brought us on. Um, it's a good call, I say. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll do a better job on the radio than your newborn. I mean. Oh, yeah. That kid, that kid, yeah, uh, he, could, he barely listens, very, let alone can speak. So. <laughs> let alone comment on the uh, existential threat to comedy right. from the existential threat. To the country. No, um, I don't know. I think it'll be fine. I, I'm a generally low worry person. I had my little anxiety symptoms during the height of the uh, COVID pandemic first setting. But I, I don't know. I just think most things we learn from and we develop uh, ways to deal with. And I think comedy's obviously got its hiccups, but people are hungry. I've been doing some shows throughout New York, like your rooftop shows, your park shows, your backyard shows. Most of them have been super fun. One of them, someone called a noise complaint and a fire complaint because there was a fire pit in the backyard. Fireman came, told us she also called a noise complaint and was like, but you know what? I'm not trying to ruin a good time. You know, just put the fire pit out and like, you know, just a warning. Somebody might come, but it's not going to be me. Well, I'm not going to bother you In these you guys. times, we now have the coolest firemen around. Harry, what do you, uh, what do you think if you're looking at your crystal ball? What does the future well, hold for comedy? Well, so here's here's the thing. When it comes to like political comedy, um, there's always this sort of it's happened in the past. I remember it was a big deal when George W. Bush was president. So you know, The Daily Show was making a lot with it. Uh, late night shows were doing a lot of monologue jokes. And when he left, there was this sort of like, oh, what's going to happen to you guys, uh, political comedians especially? Like, what are you guys going to do now? And the answer is they, they move on. They find something else. Um, as far as specifically about Donald Trump, I think Colbert is going to have maybe the most diffi difficult time doing it uh, because he ended up doing so much stuff on uh, Donald Trump. Uh, but we kind of make this mistake with comedians. We assume that because somebody has done quite a bit for a while, we assume they only have one speed. And I think uh, I think he he'll adjust and find something else. Plus, there's other political stuff that happens. You know, Obama was president for eight years, and on the left, these shows still had things to joke about. You know, not Bill policy still, so much. <laughs> not, not policy so much. So much. It, it really worked out for them that that the Republican Party was still in existence. But with uh, with Colbert, I I wonder if he's going to be sort of the Inspector Javert of comedy. And uh, th that's right, ladies and gentlemen, I just made a Les Mis reference. And spoiler alert, uh, Javert, after he gets his man, Jean Valjean, he has no other purpose in life, so he throws himself off a bridge. So I don't know. Wow. Uh, we should probably check so in on Stephen. Is that what you're saying Colbert is going to do? What's that? Go ahead. That's what Colbert is going to do on his first show on January 21st? Yeah. Off a bridge. The London Bridge, specifically. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I think it'll take adjustments because I do think that they have hired writing staffs that have been 
targeted towards a specific purpose. And I think Colbert's super talented. Colbert will pivot and, uh, you know, the rest of the hosts, mm, some of them, most of them might pivot. But I think it's going to take an, a reorg in, on a deeper level probably to switch up either writing staff or, or producers and things like that because I think that they've – you know, they it's not just a one pivot point. They've like really sharpened their tools to aim at a very particular direction. Uh or I don't know if sharpening their tools is maybe too much credit, but they've they've like well, gone they've on geared a particular it in direction. a certain direction. Like you're they saying. What? They've geared it toward a certain direction, like yeah, you were saying. For sure. Yeah. And I don't know, I think they can pivot in the end, but I don't think it's gonna be that quick and easy of a thing. Yeah, I wonder, you know, the whole idea of comedy and in particular political comedy of speaking truth to power and it's like how do you speak truth to power when you're back in power you know well, you blame it on the senate assuming that the republicans hold on to it yeah i mean that's how it worked you know in the past uh from both sides of it you know I, even talk radio i think conservative talk radio never does better than when like a democrat is in the white house so from mm -hmm. them it works but from a comedy standpoint there are always things that are happening, but it is it's not going to be the same quantity for sure because Trump was it just as a president, regardless of your party affiliation, was a lot more involved in the media just right. just via his Twitter account than anything else. So it's going to be you're right. It's going to be a bit of an adjustment. I think Colbert will have the toughest time because everybody else has a couple monologue jokes here and there, but they have other bits. Colbert really made his bones on Trump and I think he'll be fine but you're right it's going to be a big adjustment it's going to take some time to discover other bits but he might end up discovering something interesting I know when Conan left NBC um, he made the decision when he went to TBS to not do anything that they had done at NBC and started from scratch and he ended up creating some really good bits over there um, just because just being forced to do that so sometimes when you're forced into a corner creatively you're surprised with what you can come up with. So I'd be curious to see what Colbert does. SNL will be fine. They've been fine for 40 years. They'll, it, it won't have the same kick because there was a lot of, uh, I mean, Alec Baldwin playing Trump really would go viral every week in some capacity via social media, but they'll which, be fine. Which they'll was survive. astonishing in a way because I think he, is, he played one of the worst Trumps. Uh, I would say Trump is funnier than Alec Baldwin is Trump. Yeah, <laughs> I would I would agree on that. Too. And also, it's sort of like you know where does where does Trump take his comedy career right now? You know, after I mean he's he's playing these big gigs, these big rallies. Is he going to you know head back into like the alt rooms? I know it's like Dice Clay going from selling out Madison Square Garden to trying to do the comedy store again. Yeah, I I think that like that's the other half and full disclosure i don't watch a ton of the late night shows it's just not part of my routine i'll watch clips sometimes when they go viral but that's also a filter by the time it gets down to me which ones i end up watching but there is also the fact that like a lot of the content was built in with trump a lot of it is just funny clips of trump sometimes intentionally being funny sometimes uh, you know often unintentionally being funny and then a very thin layer of commentary on top of that I think maybe with the Biden presidency, we'll still have some of that. You know, one of the things that Biden is known for is his gaffes, too. And so they're still assuming that the late night shows are willing to comment on it in the same way or even in a different way, but still one that highlights the absurdity. There's probably going to be no shortage of Biden clips, you know, for, for as long as he's around <laughs> uh, to comment on and play and laugh in their own right. I'm just sad to lose all the uh, Trump material uh, during stand-up. I, I, I'm excited to see the comedians <laughs> try to stretch that out. You know how uh, <laughs> comedians will stretch a topical thing. I think you get maybe like another five months of going, like, so we got a new president before people don't want to hear your old political and, material. And, and it's also gonna, it, it's definitely going to be a test for people coming up with original material now that they don't have that subject that was just an endless stream of, yeah. of setups and, and you'll hear people fighting it too you'll hear people six months from now or a year from now like can you believe it remember when we had four years of that Re like trying to stretch it into yeah. the present day right. i always like when someone yeah doesn't want to give up on the bit you know like when someone has a bit about a tv show or something like like that's not as popular i remember people were doing like to catch a predator 
bits about that show, uh, the Dateline show, whatever, to catch a predator. And it was mm -hmm. off the air for a couple of years. You'd still see a couple comedians like clinging to that bit that used to kill because it's well, writing new material is so hard. The other day I had this what I thought would be would have been a great thought, uh, you know, like three years ago where it's like, wow, Game of Thrones really went down when they killed off all their all their best writers. Well, that just that just killed in the room. I've My never delivery was terrible. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. This is Radio Free New York. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to Radio Free New York. My name is Lou Perez. If you want to call in, hit us up at 866-552-1009. And if you're in Rochester, 585-346-3000. Um, as a comedian, I am very worried about the future, in particular... I'm worried about my son. He's seven months old, and this dude thinks that his mother is funnier than I am. I'm a mm -hmm. professional comedian, and this guy laughs at nothing I do. His mother just nuzzles him in the neck, and he cracks up. I need to find a way to cancel her. Cancel <laughs> culture, ladies and gentlemen. What a segue. Uh, go for it, Boris. Uh, well, I will say... Have you tried breastfeeding your son? <laughs> I heard that's a good way of winning your audience yeah, over. Yeah, you can connect a little bit. you got to appease the crowd, man. Yeah. So. Uh, well, speaking of which, I mentioned earlier, we'll plug our Twitters. Yeah, go for uh, it. Mine, I am a comedian and writer. It's at the Boris K. That's not the letter V. That's T-H-E, the Boris K. Harry, you want to plug yours? Uh, at Harry Turjanian is where all my information is, and you can listen to the podcast I do, Man School 202. Very cool. Are you afraid of cancellation, Harry? Uh, you know what? It, it's not so much cancellation because uh, I've done the ingenious thing of not becoming famous yet, so there's nothing <laughs> you can Brilliant, cancel me sir. from. Um, there really you can't take a paycheck away that hasn't come yet. But I, uh, I like how I said it. By the way, like your, your full title is cancellation, Harry. Cancellation, Harry. Oh, yeah. That was the kids show I was hosting. <laughs> yeah, I was teaching kids uh, how to get things that you don't like taken off the air. Um, <laughs> it goes a long way. Well, the cancel. It's not so much cancel culture for me, but there is definitely a shift in the last. You know, I've been doing stand up for more than a decade, and you can see a shift in the audience and what they um, react to, and they're definitely more sensitive than they used to be. Um, so y the other night I saw somebody doing a bit where they were using a, a, a slang for Asians, uh, but in character. They were ma kind of making fun of like Wait, old racist doing TV an Asian shows. Character? No, he didn't do it an Asian character, but he did use a word like a, a G. Ra a, a race, a, not a racist, racial slur. but like, you know, a, a character that would use that term. Right, yeah. Not necessarily as themselves. Right, and talking about how racist shows in the 60s used to be and stuff like that. And he lost the crowd. Now, they didn't, they didn't hate him or they weren't angry, but they didn't laugh. Right. And the weird balance that you have to have as a comedian is, you know, you don't want to uh, – Censor yourself, but at the same time, your job is to get people Maybe to laugh, challenge them, and, but also yeah. to challenge them a little bit to like not follow them, but have them follow you. Ideally, yeah, exactly. And you want can like I, to me, go for it. Can I ask out of curiosity? Was this a show where the audience paid money to see the show? Um, jeez, I don't recall. I know what you're getting at, which is true. Which is when people don't pay for it. Ironically, they're a little more apt to be judgmental for it is my experience what's your experience Boris on that? I fully agree and I've even noticed an interesting correlation where I've seen people in the comedy world who are very vocal about two things uh, one of those things is the idea that and I don't think this is a monolith but one of those things is the idea that cancel culture is a little bit of a myth and that it's sort of an excuse for comics who instead of writing you know, interesting or clever material, just want to be mean, just want to be sexist or racist or misogynist. Uh, and those same people that hold that ideology also often feel very strongly 
about comics being paid fairly and labor rights within the comedy world. And I found an interesting inverse correlation where the audiences that are often audiences that don't pay for comedy and go to free shows or within kind of a culture of comedy where they're not just audience but they also hang around shows or take classes, those people are also very vocal about sensitivity within comedy. And the inverse of people who go to clubs, people on the road who pay to see comics, who pay cover, who are just regular working folks that are there to have a good time, are also the ones that are the least sensitive, regardless of really any other details. It's too bad you guys can't see this, but Boris busted out a couple of Venn diagrams right now, beautifully, <laughs> uh, beautifully written. I've got the charts, I've got the data, <laughs> I've done the research. You know, I think some, something, too, when it comes to, to cancel culture, you know, if I go to a restaurant and the waiter asks me how the food was and I say, oh, I was a little salty, my goal isn't to get the waiter fired or the cook fired or the, the restaurant shut down. It's, hey, you know, I didn't enjoy this as much as I, as I would have liked to. Maybe next time you'll do a better job for me. But when it comes with cancel culture, I mean, people are basically saying, I don't want you to eat. I don't want you to be able to make a living. I'm going to in, in some cases, I'm going to follow you around to wherever you're going live and do a, a form of digital picketing of your show because I do not believe that you have the right anymore to or uh, physical to, picketing. Yeah, or physical picketing to make a living in this. And I think that's just so that's just so scary because I, I guess, grew up with the understanding, hey, if I don't like something, I turn off the channel or switch the channel or I don't. Uh, walk away. Yeah, I walk away. The idea of making it so personal and wanting to like take down somebody, take you know, take them out and ruin their livelihood is something that I just think is is pretty scary. And we've seen real life examples of it. Uh, H Harry, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I I'm a fairly left leaning guy, um, but I, I've never been a fan of this idea of if you don't like something, that it shouldn't exist for other people. You know, if I don't like a soda, I just don't buy that soda. I don't go to the supermarket and demand that they take it off the shelves. It's by the funny, way, by the way, is the least delicious soda. It's awful. And it's if you funny, by it, the wrong. way, that you proceed that with I'm a left leaning guy as if those are juxtaposed. But that's a liberal they are value at a lot of times. Right. They are, they are today. But classically, that's a liberal value. The right. You know, to stand up for other people's rights to express themselves, even if you don't like it, the right for other people to go to see a show, even if you don't like this artist or don't like the idea that they're performing. Those are classically liberal values. Those aren't really conservative values I, at I've all. De I've definitely noticed that that the people that I get along with so well who are liberals are sort of liberals from like the 90s in a way, like sort of having those 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 exact values and you know what it often comes down to it's people who have a sense of humor too it seems like that there's this thing like once you lose your sense of humor then all of these really core values of free speech of open inquiry and all that seem to go away they seem to be they seem to turn into sort of um you know censors or grand inquisitors right well i i think it stems from uh the youth movement in in the sense of what you're talking about is older liberals are a little more with it and understanding that you can get along with conservatives and things like that. I, I think it comes from a, a genuine place. They really want to make a lot of changes to the world. And I agree with a lot of those changes. I think there are issues of racism and sexism and homophobia and all that that, that do need to Which be are addressed. All sponsors Th of this show. That's racism, right, yes. Sex, <laughs> sexism and homophobia. Uh, we're going spots. to give you a discount code, 10% off all uh, uh, sexism, guys. If you just use the code Lou Perez, you <laughs> can get 10% <laughs> off. But the thing that I think they try to cancel stuff because they have the most direct effect that way. They can actually have an effect immediately, right. and they can feel like they're involved. So it's a weird situation because I do agree with where the movement comes from. I just don't agree with the methodology, and I don't know why, because society is broken, that we're trying to fix comedy. But mm. it's just the low-hanging fruit that you can actually have a change with. And that's, but it, I think it also it's going to – it's a phase. It goes back and forth. It always kind of has. Uh, and it will swing back the other way. I think where the, it, the, the noise is going to cancel itself out because the more people complain, there's nothing you can do that people don't complain about. Right. And I think I that's going to wear itself out. Yeah, we talked about this earlier, Lou and I, but I think it is sort of a developing a herd immunity 
for a cancellation <laughs> is sort of what it comes down to. Uh, I agree with you. I'm optimistic in the sense that I think that there's in the short run problems, and that's not specific to comedy. You know, there's ordinary workers throughout the country that have been quote unquote canceled. There's a great uh, so you've been publicly shamed is a great book with some examples of it, but people who are not in entertainment, who are not publicly facing people, who are in an an odd position with somebody who. And and I think this would be more not like a psychological phenomenon almost. There's the term like locust of control, and I think that when people feel like in their lives there's not a lot within their locust of control, there's not a lot that they can uh, have a handle on, they grasp for these things. And so, you know, tweeting at somebody and trying to get other people mad at them or trying to prevent them from calling a venue and saying you shouldn't have this person perform there. And I'm not saying blanket, that's always the wrong thing to do, but for some people that's a reach to try to have a control. Yeah, and I think one thing is definitely going to become evident is that the same people who call for cancel culture, they ask you to unfriend or disavow people who are good to you in exchange for people who will eventually treat you like garbage as well. But we're not treating you like garbage, ladies and gentlemen. We are Radio Free New York, and we will be right back. Hey. Hey, welcome back to Radio Free New York. I'm Lou Perez. If you want to call in, hit us up at 866-552-1009, or if you're in Rochester, 585 346 3,000. If you're calling in, just to let you know, if you ask me who I voted for, I'm not telling you because I want to keep working. And I have no idea which candidate is going to make me lose a job, whether it's tomorrow, next week, four years from now, ten years from now. So I'm keeping that secret to myself. People are making lists, ladies and gentlemen, and I do not want to be on that list. We're talking comedy. I'm a comedian. I have my two good friends, Harry Turjanian and Boris Hyken. On, we're talking comedy in New York, in Los Angeles, and I want to talk a little bit about what the scenes look like now in New York, in L.A. Now that we, uh, you know, we've been hit by COVID, looks like we're getting hit hard again. Uh, what's happening, Harry? You're over in Los Angeles for a little bit. What's going on over there? Yeah, so it's pretty strict out here. Um, I think both coasts are doing. Technically, they're not supposed to be doing comedy, right? So what's going on, I know, in New York is that they're just kind of doing it some places outdoors for the most part. L.A.'s kind of doing the same thing. A lot of the comedy clubs here are suffering because they're not allowed to run shows. I know one comedy club, the Ha Ha Comedy Club, that I performed at when I was here last time, they've had to go back to being a Mexican restaurant to survive. So they, they reverse their sort of order there. They had to get in some big screen TVs, so they have stuff the, for football. The comedians had to throw out all their material and learn how to cook. Yeah, <laughs> it's very awkward because they are not skilled at all. If you know anything about comedians, they have zero skills other than comedy. So, and they're not and even all, that funny all the, when they all serve the Mexican you. comics are really upset that they're like being thrown in the back of a kitchen. Yeah, right. And the white ones' accents are very offensive that they're they are. doing all of a sudden. Some of them they sound are. Italian. It's <laughs> weird. Yeah, hey, but the food is so good. Yeah. The food is so good, you tolerate it, but you're like, you feel <laughs> uncomfortable until the food gets there. It's a little awkward, but they're trying to survive any way they can. Um, I know that uh, I think Stand Up New York decided to do some shows out here. I did one, I went to one the other night, and it was an outdoor venue, and uh, technically you're not allowed to do it. So officially, it was a protest. It was a protest against not allowing comedy clubs, but that didn't stop a lady who, I never realized that uh, a Karen has a body position, like a posture. You could see somebody, <laughs> you could see somebody has, is an irritated attitude as they're walking towards the showroom. Uh, they were off the street and they were filming and started using the word slapped in the face was the term she used, which lets me know she has never been slapped in the face because <laughs> it wasn't a slap in the face, it was just a comedy show. Right. Um, Whenever you bring up the the you know the the Karen you know sort of meme or or the the persona, I always think about you know sort of uh, uh, suburban mom haircuts. But yeah. then I realize like suburban mom haircuts are basically the haircuts that emo kids used to have. You know where it's sort of like spiked up in the back and then 
there's like some bangs that are just uh, about the bob. To yeah, a I think bit. we're the wrong three dudes to probably discuss women's haircuts with any sort of accuracy. But that sounds right to well, me. Well, look, man, if I need to open up a hair salon in order to do a comedy show, <laughs> then I'm gonna have to learn everything I need to learn about women. <laughs> just pretending to cut hair while we perform, ruining um, everyone. This head. lady absolutely had that haircut, by the way. So she yeah. broke no stereotypes. I mean, the <laughs> whole thing. But, you know, they called the neighbors and it was uh, they had to kind of take away the microphone halfway to through the oh, show wow. Wow. to avoid, you know, like the the sound, the noise complaint. It's a public then, park. Is it a large space? No, it's an outdoor patio. Like in L.A., a lot of these places already have outdoor seating. Right. Because it's seasonal and they can in L.A. rather. I'm sorry. Um, they have outdoor seating. So they have a space that they can use. But you're just legally not allowed to do it, which is very odd because th I guess there's this theory that laughter is going to spread the virus a little bit more, which is, I think, what Cuomo was talking about. So for whatever reason, you're not allowed to do comedy shows no matter what. But I, I and I've done some on the East Coast. Uh, you can talk more about that, Boris. You've done more in New York than I have. But there are rooftops. If you can find a good one, they're, they're in public parks. I haven't done one of the park ones, but it feels awkward a little you, bit. You, you would think like in, in Los Angeles. I mean, one of, the, one of the great things about Los Angeles is that it's basically the same weather all year round. So if you had a parking lot where you could actually, you know, safely socially distance, um, you know, you know, uh, make it so that you spread the seats out. So if a real heavy hitter, like you know, say Bill Burr, uh, comes in, is going to make people laugh. Like they're further apart, where their spit isn't going to, you know, hit one another. But it just seems like, man, what a uh, y you have uh, you have the solution right in front of you. It's the like weather. just do it. You know, just do it. Yeah, I think in New York, from my experience, for starters, I'll say that people are hungry for it. I have done rooftop shows, I've done park shows, I did a backyard show the other night, and for the most part, everyone's very happy to be there, everyone's very appreciative. The park shows, despite awkward, the first one I did in Central Park, I made a joke at the time, because it was just after, I was like, wow, I'm so excited to be here, where Rick Moranis was recently assaulted. <laughs> it was like blocks <laughs> away from where he got punched in the face. And of all the things to happen in the park there, you know, comedy's not gonna be the worst one. Uh, people are spread out for the most part now there's micro in the beginning some of the shows didn't have microphones which to me did not sound like a great time but now everyone's got a, a kind of a role going they've got their equipment most of the time people don't get bothered like I said on the Karen tip I did a backyard show in Astoria and I watched this woman look out her window it was a Friday night at 9 30 p.m. so I, I know for a fact because I literally looked at my watch and I was like oh are we bothering her? I looked at my watch. Oh, no, it's 930. This is pretty reasonable. There's one comic left and then me. No, she called um, the – well, apparently she called a fire complaint because there was a, um, a fire pit, which is not allowed, and a noise complaint. So like I said, the fireman was cool about it. He had us put out the fire, let us continue the show. show was great. Everyone had a good time despite the fact that she called. Yeah. If you're out there uh, listening to Radio Free New York and you've been to a comedy show – why don't you call in and let us know how it went. 866-552-1009. Rochester, we need to hear from you. 585-346-3000. Or if you haven't been to a show, what would you need to happen for you to go to a show? Whether it's safety measures, whether it's a lineup that you'll never see ever again. What's preventing you aside from a global pandemic? Hey, yeah. come on. <laughs> you know, in New York, uh, one of the... You know, one of the, re the harsh realities is that we have so many places, restaurants, bars that are closing down because they just can't stay open. They can't afford to stay open under the, uh, you know, under the regulations that, that we have here. And we recently lost a local club called the Creek in the Cave that was out in uh, Long Island City. I performed there uh, just one time. I did, it was actually a show where the theme was poop. So every story was a poop story, um, and it was not, you know, heavily attended um, by the fourth person, which I think I might have been the third one. By the fourth person, it was like, you know, we maybe maybe a different theme would be would have been good. Um, but I wish that I had that I had performed at other shows um, at the. See, I don't like that uh, quitting attitude, Lou. You know, <laughs> where would the Wright brothers be if they just gave up after the first time? After the first poop story that they yeah. did. 
Uh, uh, Boris, um, I mean, I've done a lot of shows at the Creek. Some of them were great. Some of them were not as great. I think it's sad to lose the venue. I think they were not doing amazing prior to the pandemic. So that, truth be told, there's I, I think there's a combination of feelings here, right? There is, like I said, in the long term, the like idea of existential threat to these institutions and to comedy, which I don't feel. I feel like people will adapt. I think right now already I see new businesses popping up because rent is plummeting and there's going to be somebody else with the leverage to take advantage of that. And then, of course, in the short run, there's going to be a ton of people whose lives are messed up because of this, people who have lost their life's work putting this stuff together. Um, Rebecca Trent, who is the owner of The Creek, put in a lot of work. And I, uh, you know, I'm not super close with her, but I know that she's given a lot of opportunities to a lot of comics. She, you know, she cared about this enough where you're going to have good and bad aspects of that, but enough where she put many years of her life towards building this thing up. So that's obviously a shame people have mixed feelings on it otherwise i think that's totally fine but you know the reality is i think in the short run a lot's going to get messed up in the long run i think everybody's going to be okay all right ladies and gentlemen i hope you're going to be okay we're going to take a break right now but when we come back you're going to hear more from me lou perez my guests boris hyken and harry Turgenian here on radio free new york if you are upset by what we have done, be upset at me. County executive did not do this. The village mayor did not do this. The city mayor did not make these decisions. I made these decisions. It's not your local elected official. I know they caused disruption. I know people are upset. I know businesses will be hurt by this. Wow, the governor coming out and basically saying, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I'm talking directly to you. I am to be blamed for everything going wrong in your life. And what are you going to do about it? What does this mean? It means <laughs> I'm going to tear your head off if you get out of line. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Radio Free New York. I'm Lou Perez. Our phone lines are open. They're buzzing. 866-552-1009. Rochester. Where are you, Rochester? 585 346 3,000. Our last segment, we were talking about the different scenes when it comes to comedy in New York and L.A. Uh, Harry, um, tell us a little bit about what happened with the clubs in New York. Yeah, well, speaking of uh, Governor Cuomo, uh, there's never been a real plan laid out for comedy clubs to reopen. In fact, they've, despite restaurants, at least at the time, being allowed to be open at like a minimal capacity, comedy clubs have been a hard no. And so all the comedy clubs had gotten together. And, you know, I mean, that says a lot because comedy club owners uh, are not honorable people who love each other. They're not <laughs> lovey-dovey. I mean... Uh, these are not the, honorable people. These are not honorable men. But this is the business we've chosen, Lou. <laughs> uh, so they got together and we did a, they did like a presser, you know, uh, to try to... Pr and they presented a joint plan to open it up for the governor to approve it, and it just didn't happen. I think the governor has no interest in letting comedy happen at all, but it's, it's very odd because I think live music is allowed to happen. I think you're allowed to go bowling. There's a lot of weird S things. So I looked at that, uh, the ordinance, and it's really interesting, and I could hear the justification for it, which is it, it, this is specifically if you're, you have a liquor license, so it's a state liquor authority thing. But they had the different phases at which you could open. And then it explicitly said no comedy and no exotic dancing. And music was specifically tied to the genre of music. You needed a license not just for music, but the specific genre of music at your venue. Which if I play, uh, you know, devil's advocate here, I can see how you might say, okay, we're trying to limit the spread and so if you're licensed for one DJ, it's not the same as having a 12-piece swing band blown through a bunch of horns in a restaurant. But uh. obviously, when you go to actually enforce that, you have, a, you, know, you, you have a bunch of people who are not necessarily the most competent people, and maybe some that are. But you have a lot of levels now that are going towards walking around and enforcing these things for businesses that are already struggling. So, so, so those, those ordinances had to do with the actual music makers themselves, not with the audience. Because I, I can see an argument being made where, look, you could be a DJ, but you cannot spin salsa. 
because <laughs> salsa makes people dance, and we don't want people on the dance floor and all that. So you're gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to spin some bony bear, some grizzly bear, you know, some some you know, some <laughs> stuff that people are just gonna want to keep them slow, keep, keep them away them from calm, each other. Some light jazz, maybe acid jazz is the furthest we'll go. No, but also you know it makes a difference whether it's one musician or ten musicians, whether they're pushing buttons on a keyboard or whether they're belting out loud. But again, I think it's very different when you present that in an ideal fashion and then you actually try to implement it no over room, a complex no system. No room for beatboxers. That's it. Too no. much spit. Too much spit hitting the mic. No, no room for beatboxers. Even though it's technically a one-man band, you know, one person replacing. I got. I have a lot of reverence. They're hard workers. What, what about well, the Soul Train line? Can we have a Soul Train line if everyone's six feet apart? I know it's going to be a very long line, and you'll get very tired. <laughs> it's going to wrap around the building. Yeah. Look, it, people got online to vote, you know, so people can get online. It's a to, Soul Caravan yeah. at that yeah, point. Yeah, ex exactly. So I don't think it's uh, unreasonable. <laughs> with um, it, it looks like a lot of places are, are going to be locking down soon. I saw something about Chicago is going to be uh, having a lockdown um, you guys are two close friends of mine, so I wanted to get some of your recommendations. What can people be doing during the lockdown? What movies should they be watching? What documentaries? Uh, Boris, you were talking about the uh, documentary series on Netflix, Social Dilemma. What do you think about that? Uh, that was okay. I mean, I, I watched it. I think they presented the problem well, but I don't think they explored. They they spent a lot of time, almost too much time, telling you all the problems with social media, which uh, we kind of got the gist of it a little faster than they played it out through. And then they spent very little time at the end really dissecting their presented solution, which was, of course, regulate it, please, Mr. Government, which, again, that c there could be arguments for it, but it was just a very not explored. They just presented it very simply, and I, I found that pretty disappointing that obviously there's a lot of nuance to how you implement such a thing if you were to. There's a lot of ways to do it. There's a lot of aspects, whether it's in, you mentioned having an independent. Oh, yeah third party do it which to me is kind of or you mentioned actually to me earlier well, well, well yeah well uh, so I, I haven't watched social dilemma but i have read op-eds in the past talking about either the government coming in and regulating social media platforms outright or cr or or basically uh, the state creating its own social media site and people put it as a way of look that's the way you're going to keep the nazis off that's where you're going to keep the alt-right off that's where you're going to keep all of these really terrible people off but it's like this. Look, if the government builds a platform, the government is at, at needs to act within the First Amendment. So what that means is if the what that means is if <laughs> the government makes a platform, then the Nazis have a First Amendment right to be on that platform. Right. You can't regulate speech now because it's protected. But, you know, there's two funny things to me about that. The first is just the idea of a public option for social media, you know, but and, and what's even funnier about that is just thinking about the idea of the government building a social media platform after watching the congressional hearings and how ridiculous and inept and entirely antiquated the perspectives of the people involved are. Each invited person needs people. a physical handshake before they're allowed onto the platform. It's truly one of those things where the expression you know, a, a thousand geniuses won't think of what one idiot will think of. It's really one of those things where I truly cannot imagine the real-life absurdity and incompetence that would be if the government tried to build a Facebook. I mean, it's truly – out of all the things – I'm not a, a blanket, you know, libertarian. There are certain things the government can do. There are certain things the government needs to do. But trying to build a complex digital system of communication – sounds laughable well i just want to say you know for you listeners out there boris just you know he just fired a he just fired the first shot he's not a libertarian if you're a libertarian out there that means that it's your time to get on this program and argue with this dude because that's what libertarians do 866-552-1009-585-346-3000 uh harry uh do you have any recommendations for well first of all I think that's what libertarians do should be the slogan, like the <laughs> from going forward for the entire party. Like, that's what libertarians do. Like Elizabeth uh, Warren, that's what yeah. women do. <laughs> that's what libertarians do. Um, you know what I've actually done is, uh, you know, I, there's some new stuff here and there. There's a lot of cool stuff. I have all the streaming services, so it's almost too much stuff. 
but I've actually gone back to just watching some of the old stuff I remember liking as a kid or, you know, like just uh, I like I started watching Columbo. Like that's what I'm binging is like old episodes of Columbo. <laughs> I think it's on Peacock and uh, don't sleep on Columbo, kids. That's all I'm saying. Um, there's so much good stuff, but I actually have decided like rather than rolling the dice here and there, you know, you watch a new film, you get excited. Go back to some of the stuff you used to like a little bit that you haven't watched in a little bit that you go, oh, I remember liking that. Let me give it another look for the first time in 10 years. Yeah. And it's actually a really great experience because, you know, I guess it's less risky or whatever. As, as, as much risk as you can take by binging, I'm a wild and, man. And I, and I would also recommend, too, if you can do it, if you have a partner, um, to, exp to experience something, a program that you loved watching, uh, vicariously, being able to look over and watch someone experience it for the first time, I think is pretty cool. Uh, before we go, I want to um, give uh, many, many thanks to my two guests, Boris Hyken, Harry Turgenian. Guys, let them know how they can find you. Yeah, quick plug on Twitter. You can find me at the Boris K, and also at Bushwick Bears. I have a podcast, Bushwick Bears Podcast. Everyone should check that out as well. Cool. Harry, how can we find you? Uh, you could find all my stuff at Harry Turjanian on social media. You could also check out the podcast. I do Man School 202, uh, sex, relationship advice, and comedy uh, for the male perspective. Thank you so much. This is Lou Perez. Check me out at the Lou Perez on all platforms. Radio Free New York. Peace. <laughs>